So now do I start the presentation? Or, or? Um, yeah, I'm just um, we're waiting for a couple of other people, but thanks everyone for um, for um, joining us tonight for another presentation from uh, from our webinar um, series. And um, I just wanted to make sure if somebody can put in the chat box that um, that they can hear us, okay? I've got some, uh, yeah, excellent, good. Thanks, Amanda, thanks, Adam. That's great. All right, good. So we've got everybody uh, listening and watching. So I'm um, very excited to um, um, uh, present um, Dr. Charles Kuntz again to give this uh, webinar tonight. He's um, um, founder of Southpaw's Veterinary Surgery for um, Specialty for um, Animals, and um, we've been working with him for quite a few years now. And um, is uh, one of the only one of uh, very few uh, veterinary surgeons who's uh, a specialist in a specialist surgeon, but also a specialist oncologist. So um, very privileged to have him tonight. So um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, hand over to you, Charles, because I can stay here talking forever about all your credentials and experience, and um, I know we're sort of uh, trying to keep to a time. So um, over to you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm quite excited to be here and I was just talking to Noam about the fact that I just got back from the American College of Veterinary Surgeons meeting in Seattle last week uh, and I'm very uh, energized for some new ideas and new procedures and stuff that we're going to start implementing in our practice. Now when I do the seminar tonight I'm doing it in a different way so it's not a PowerPoint presentation it's more of a mind map uh, and I would be very interested in your comments about how uh, it uh, translates over a webinar um, and how the animation works and that kind of thing and um, yeah so I'd be really uh, appreciative if you could comment on that. Uh, so tonight as the title suggests I'm going to talk about oral tumors in dogs and cats and oral tumors are one, you know, one of the most common presentations that we see certainly to an oncology practice and my intent is to give you some tools that you can use when you step in the exam room uh, and you see a patient that has an oral tumor as well as uh, talking to you about um, different treatment options and things like that that are available. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see here. So uh, by way of introduction, um, oral tumors make up 6% of all tumors in dogs and cats and that's actually quite a, you know, quite a few. Uh, we see them very frequently today. I saw a couple of them last week, I would have seen three or four, and in the last year I probably would have seen a hundred. Uh, so I know that they are coming into primary care practices for them to be referred to me. Uh, there's a tendency that we have as veterinarians, and the same thing happens in human medicine, uh, the saying that I use is when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And what that refers to is the tendency to try to apply the technology that we have in-house to everything that comes through the front door. And what we have to do is remember that just because we don't have a treatment modality in our practice, that doesn't mean that that's not the best thing uh, for the patient. And say, for example, we have radiation therapy in our practice, but it's not the best radiation therapy for brain tumors, as an example. And so whenever we have a brain tumor come in, we always refer those cases to Brisbane Vet Specialist Center. Uh, where they have mega voltage and so we just have to remember that there are more tools available to us than what we would have just in our own toolbox or our, in our own practices. Now I'd like to talk to you about a couple of definitions. The first is uh, recurrence and when I talk about recurrence that means that the tumor has come back in the same location that we removed previously and that generally implies that there are tumor cells left behind by our surgery. And then metastasis implies that the tumor cells have gone into either blood vessels or lymphatics or potentially uh, pleural or peritoneal space and moved to another organ or another area and then set up shop and started growing again. So that's an important distinction that when I talk about recurrence, I'm generally talking about at the primary tumor site. And when I talk about metastasis, I'm talking about distant sites. So uh, whenever I talk about the management of tumors, I think it's a good idea to review the steps for success, successful surgical oncology. And I've talked before about checklists and how helpful they are in, um, in guiding us and giving us a little bit of a, a safety net uh, when managing our patients. And that certainly applies to cancer treatment. 
So the first thing that we have to do is to make a diagnosis. And uh, that is particularly important for oral tumors because you have a variety of different tumors that behave in vastly different fashions. And so if we assume that we have an ampulus and it turns out to be a melanotic melanoma, we're going to have a very disappointed client. We're also potentially going to treat the, the tumor inappropriately. And so the reason to make a diagnosis before treatment is if it's going to change what we're going to do or if it's going to change the owner's willingness to do that. And so that certainly applies to oral tumors. Now the next thing we're going to do once we make our diagnosis, and that can be either through a biopsy or potentially cytology, although we tend to use cytology less frequently in uh, oral tumors, uh, is to gather information. And there's a lot of information that you want to get together so that you can then present a concise um, picture to the client uh, and they can make appropriate treatment decisions. So the first thing that we want to know from our um, uh, data collection or information collection is what's the typical behavior of the tumor? Is it going to metastasize? Is it going to recur frequently at the primary tumor site? Uh, is chemotherapy helpful? Those sorts of things. And so obviously we can't collect that information unless we've got a diagnosis. So the other thing that we're going to look at is variations in the tumor behavior by species, breed, gender, and anatomic location. So to give you an example, mast cell tumors uh, that aren't specifically an oral tumor, although they do occur in the mouth sometimes, in dogs they can have a very varied behavior, whereas in cats they tend to be quite benign. Uh, with breeds, uh, again going back to mast cell tumors, Sharpays and pugs tend to have quite aggressive mast cell tumors, whereas uh, you know, boxers tend to have less aggressive mast cell tumors. Uh, gender and anatomic location, well, uh, with respect to anatomic location, if you have a mast cell tumor that occurs at a mucocutaneous junction, like on the vulva or on the penis, those are going to be much more aggressive than ones that occur on the skin. So that's, again, all information that we're going to want to have before we start prescribing a treatment protocol. The next thing we want to do is when we look at this tumor, is a curative intent surgery possible? You know, is it just so big or in a location that we can't possibly remove it, or is it something that we can treat surgically? And with most tumor types and pretty much all tumor types that occur in the mouth, surgery is the best option if, you know, if a curative intent surgery is possible. Now this patient had an osteosarcoma in the mouth, and while that looks horrendous, um, the surgery was actually fairly straightforward, and with the addition of chemotherapy, we were able to get about 13 months survival in this patient. When we think about surgery, the next thing we want to look at is what is the extent of surgery required for a cure? And it's very different if you're dealing with, for example, a fibrominous epulis as opposed to a fibrosarcoma. And I will mention this later, but fibrosarcomas that occur in the mouth are associated with likely the highest recurrence rate of any tumor that I deal with, with any frequency. So even worse than injection site sarcomas in cats, fibrosarcomas in the mouth of dogs, um, I probably have somewhere between 30 and 50 percent recurrence rates, and that's even if I have clean or histologically clean surgical margins. So the extent of sur surgery that you need for a cure is going to vary with each tumor type. Now, the next thing we're going to want to look at is the tendency and typical location of metastasis. Starting with an apulis, that has no likelihood of metastasis, that's so never spread. If you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum with melanoma, if you have a large melanoma, virtually 100% of those are going to metastasize. Again, all information that you need when you're prescribing a treatment protocol. Now another thing that's really important is to look at perineoplastic syndromes, and they're less frequent with oral tumors specifically, but you know, with hypercalcemia and lymphoma, hypercalcemia and anal sac adenocarcinoma, uh, leiomyoma in the abdomen, and hypoglycemia. These are all things that we need to be aware of and look for. And then the next thing is, can systemic spread be mitigated by chemotherapy? And so tumors that occur in the mouth, most common one that we would treat with chemotherapy would be uh, melanoma, and, and it appears that chemotherapy is quite helpful in preventing metastasis, 
that's in contrast to, for example, a fibrosarcoma where they have about a 20% chance of spread and chemotherapy is of no benefit at all in preventing metastasis. And then the next question is, is residual tumor responsive to radiation therapy or chemotherapy? Uh, the fact is that with oral tumors, most of them are quite responsive to radiation therapy, although radiation therapy is going to be much more effective if we can get that tumor down to microscopic, uh, uh, microscopic residual cells rather than a large mass macroscopic tumor. So radiation therapy is much more effective for microscopic disease than it is for macroscopic disease. Um, again, I would like to encourage you, if you have questions, to please put them on the chat box in the corner. Um, I'd be happy to pause uh, and answer any questions that you might have. So now that we've collected all our information, we have our diagnosis, we've gone to the, the textbooks or the journals or VIN or talked to our specialists or whatever, collected all this information, we're going to sit down with the owners and give them a complete picture. Okay, this is the tumor that we have, this is how it behaves, and these are the options that we can provide you. The next thing that we're going to do after we talk to the owners is we're going to do complete staging. And staging applies to the extent of the primary tumor and the extent of secondary metastasis. Now when we're looking at the primary tumor, we're going to do things like take radiographs or CT scans or that sort of thing. When we look at secondary metastasis, we're going to be doing things like lymph node, um, uh, lymph node aspirates and, uh, and uh, thoracic radiographs or CT scan. Now I have a question um, that says, does this mean you cut it out then do radiation therapy? And the answer to that is yes. So we usually like to get them down to microscopic disease first with surgery and then we follow up with radiation therapy. And the radiation therapy uh, can be performed about two weeks after surgery. What happens if you do radiation therapy too soon, it basically freezes the healing process at the point at which radiation therapy started. And so if you don't have a completely healed wound and then you start radiation therapy, it's just going to lock it in that non-healing wound state. And particularly with the oral cavity, you don't want non-healing wounds in there because then you get into things like oral nasal fistulas and stuff like that. So I'm back over here. All right, now once we've done our complete stage and we go back to the owners and say, okay, this is where the tumor is and this is where it's not, and then we can start talking about treatment, treatment options. So if we're going to do a surgery, we always want to do a curative intent surgery. And with the tumors that I'm going to discuss, and I'll review them, um, I'll, I'll actually go over them several times with you, but from least aggressive, which would be an epulis, next would be a fibrosarcoma, after that would be a squamous cell carcinoma, then an osteosarcoma, and then a melanoma. With any one of those tumors, you need to take bone out, as well as teeth and gingiva and everything, or you're going to leave tumor cells behind. The exception to that would be a fibrominous epulis uh, or an ossifying epulis, which occurs around the teeth. And with those, you can be less aggressive. But with any of those other tumors, acanthomatous epulis, fibrosarcoma, squamous cell carcinoma, osteosarcoma, or melanoma, you have to do a big surgery with big complete margins, take bone out, take soft tissue out, and get a, you know, get a, a clean primary tumor margin. Now after we take our tumor sample out, we're going to want to mark and then assess our surgical margins. And this is a very elaborate marking system where they mark each surgical margin with a different color and that's done often in humans, but in veterinary medicine, basically what we're going to do is we're going to paint the whole cut surface with India ink uh, from the office supply store or with a yellow ink, and I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Noam, if you are listening and you can remember the name of that yellow ink that we use, please, um, please post it and I'll read it out. Um, but we just want something that's going to tell the pathologist are their tumor cells touching the surgical margin. And the completeness of surgical margins are predictive of local recurrence, again, the place that I would be really careful with that is with um, fibrosarcomas because fibrosarcomas can recur despite the fact that the margins look like they're clean. Now I do have a question that says, um, what about large lumps with no organisms and no cancer cells, mastiffs particularly? Now I don't know specifically 
um, uh, you know, it's something that mastiffs are predisposed to, but one thing that you can have, it's a condition called low-grade, high-grade fibrosarcoma. And um, these look histologically very benign and can look even like scar tissue, but they behave like fibrosarcomas with about a 20% metastatic rate and a very high rate of local recurrence. And so if you do a biopsy on a tumor that's occurring in the mouth and it looks like a tumor and it smells like a tumor, but all you get back is either scar tissue or fibroma or, um, or something like that, that is very likely to be a fibrosarcoma. Now the next question is, what is the rate of success in controlling oral tumor metastasis? Remember that whenever we're pulling chemotherapy out, we're rarely looking for a cure, we're just looking for a prolongation of life. And when we use chemotherapy for osteosarcoma and melanoma, the success rate or the survival rate that I give is somewhere between two and three times what we would have if we didn't use chemotherapy. And so with a melanoma, if our median survival time is you know, four months without chemotherapy, with surgery alone, I would say it would be kind of eight to 12 months with chemotherapy. With osteosarcoma, the, um, the survival time without chemotherapy for oral tumors may be a year, and with chemotherapy maybe kind of a year and a half to two years. So those are kind of generally the numbers that we're talking about. All right, now if we ink our surgical margins and then we find out that the margins are dirty, we have a few different options available. In Victoria and in uh, Queensland, so in Brisbane and in Melbourne, we're lucky that we have radiation therapy. And radiation therapy is very effective for cleaning up dirty margins, uh, that is microscopically dirty margins with oral tumors. Uh, metronomic chemotherapy is when you use paroxicam and cyclophosphamide. And with fibrosarcomas that occur in places other than the mouth, um, it's equally effective to radiation therapy. So if you got a dirty margin on a tumor on the chest wall or something that was a fibrosarcoma and the owners can't afford or decide not to do radiation therapy, you can do metronomic chemotherapy, which is cyclophosphamide and paroxicam given every other day for the rest of their lives, and that's going to work as well as radiation therapy. Now, I'm not aware of anybody having looked at metronomic chemotherapy for oral tumors, but I would imagine that at least with fibrosarcoma, it would probably be um, at least somewhat effective in preventing local recurrence. And then potentially the best thing that you can do is a repeated surgery and just get a clean margin because again, surgery is going to be our best option for local control of tumor. And so if we can do a repeated surgery that's going to get us a clean margin, that's always our best bet. And that's a very common thing that we get where somebody will uh, do an excisional biopsy of a mass that occurred on the mandible, kind of slice it off at the gingival margin and it'll come back a fibrosarcoma. So we'll come back, do a repeated surgery, which is going to remove, uh, involve removal of a portion of the mandible and, and get a clean margin and then that has a potential to be curative. All right, now we've gone back and checked our surgical margins and then we come back and discuss with our owners what we've, you know, what we've accomplished with the surgery. Now, I do ha have a comment, do you weigh up how long the animal will be unwell from chemo in relation to the life expectancy post chemo when discussing with the client? And I absolutely do. And so, um, and Noam, if you could stop for just a second on the questions because they're going by on my screen. Um, and so, um, so to, let me just go back to this one, okay, so... Yeah, so Charles, you should was, be able to just uh, scroll up and down if you need to, to view the yeah. questions. Cool. Yeah, so um, we certainly discussed with the owners the likely effect of on quality of life of the chemotherapy when we're deciding how much longer they're going to live with chemo and without chemotherapy. That's certainly the, something that we want to talk about. Now we have another question, what about the tumors which get rapidly worse with the metronomic chemotherapy? I'm not aware of any tumors that get worse specifically with uh, the metronomic chemotherapy, but if the person that posed that question knows specifically of a situation where they do get worse, I'd, I'd be happy to discuss that with um, the attendees at the webinar. And then the last question is, is it safe to use laser therapy to promote tissue recovery after an oral tumor surgery and with radiotherapy and chemotherapy? So laser therapy um, is, it's something that's really good for taking like gingival hyperplasia 
and maybe little fibromatous epiluses and things like that from around the teeth. And that's fine to use with any other modality like radiotherapy or chemotherapy. I find that laser has, um, oh, wait a minute, I think I misunderstood that. I was, I was looking at laser therapy as in a, uh, a way to excise the tumors, but I think what they're asking is laser therapy to promote tissue recovery, and I honestly don't know anything about that. I don't have laser in my practice. So um, I would imagine that if it's been shown to be effective with other tissues, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be effective with oral tissue or uh, oral tumors. And then the next, um, next question is, is there any evidence in animals that paroxicam is more effective than other non-steroidals like meloxicam? And that's a really good question, and, and that would be, uh, it'd be great if we could find that meloxicam was as effective because the um, side effect profile of meloxicam is going to be better than paroxicam, but uh, generally kind of the classic one is paroxicam that we always talk about. I was aware of a study that was done that did tissue culture where they looked at paroxicam as well as a few other non-steroidals and found that paroxicam was more effective at preventing tissue, um, uh, tissue growth that was in cell culture, so not in situ. But I can't remember if meloxicam was one of the drugs that was tested. It was quite an old study. Um, so if anybody has any more information on that, I'd be interested in hearing it, but I don't think that meloxicam has been looked at specifically. I know that there are lots of studies that are in progress that's it, that are set out to answer exactly that question, but I'm not aware of any, uh, any definitive results. So next thing we're going to do is, is chemotherapy. Um, if it's indicated, and specifically in the mouth, we're talking about osteosarcoma and melanoma. Remember that... Um, that chemotherapy with the doses that we use, about 80% of dogs are going to go through without any significant side effects. Um, so that's important to remember. Now, just going back to general discussion about oral tumors, let's discuss um, clinical signs. The other, so we've just had another question is, what about Prevacox? And again, I'm not aware of Prevacox being looked at in this setting. Um, the only thing that's been published, to my knowledge, specifically looking at metronomic chemotherapy, is, um, is paroxicam. Uh, so clinical signs, some of them are obvious. You know, the owner will, will be doing something or playing with the dog, or the dog will give them a lick, and they'll see a large tumor. And this is a tonsillar squamous cell carcinoma. That's generally a really bad tumor, um, and that's one that... Um, uh, that you might see and might present also with halitosis or something like that. Now there's another comment that said laser therapy, surgically and laser acupuncture are not the same thing. Um, not too dangerous to local laser acupuncture short wave length flight. So I'm not sure exactly. Um, I, I understand that uh, uh, laser therapy is different from, um, from surgical laser and so um, again, I'm not an expert on either one of those modalities, and so I would probably advise that you talk to um, one of the representatives who sells the equipment uh, to look at the effects on wound healing. <clears throat> Back on clinical signs, um, the next thing we see sometimes is hypersalivation, and that can often be the presenting clinical sign. Um, exophthalmus, if you have a caudal uh, ma uh, mass that's pretty far back, in the mouth and is pushing through the roof of the mouth, sometimes you'll see the eye uh, protrude as well. Epistaxis, again, if you have a tumor that's uh, invading into the nose, that can be a presenting clinical sign. Weight loss, hopefully not to this extent by the time they get to us. Halitosis. And other signs that we might see would be, let me just move this out of the way so I can see, bloody oral discharge, um, dysphagia, uh, pain and facial swelling, and then secondary lymphadenopathy. So we might see uh, that the patient might present just because the lymph nodes are enlarged. So as far as diagnosis is concerned, um, cytology is something that we use very frequently with other tumor locations, but uh, not very often in the mouth. <clears throat> One thing that is coming on the 
forefront is using cytology to diagnose osteosarcoma. And often you can see the sarcoma cells and you can see um, osteoid being produced. And then I was just talking to Noam about ASAP <clears throat> doing uh, alkaline phosphatase staining on cytology samples, which can give you basically an almost instant diagnosis of osteosarcoma. And so we're looking about at that to see if that's something that ASAP can provide to us. Um, incisional biopsy obviously is the you know kind of the gold standard. Um, you want to take a pretty significant chunk of tissue, remembering that we don't want to negatively uh, affect our potential for curative surgery later on. So oral tumors are usually are pretty easy. Um, to get a biopsy, especially if there's something that's protruding into the oral cavity. My tendency is not to go through the skin to get my biopsy because that's going to affect my surgery ultimately. So I'd rather get a, a biopsy from inside the mouth rather than through the skin underneath the mandible or over the maxilla. So when we're <clears throat> doing incisional biopsies, there are a few things uh, that we want to consider. So particularly with oral tumors, there's a vast variation in tumor behavior uh, with respect to histologic type and grade. So we really want to get a biopsy on these before we treat them. We want a large specimen because some tumors are infected in necrotic. Avoid electrocautery because that's going to affect the, the uh, architecture of the cells. And so we make it an inaccurate reading. Um, try to avoid contaminating normal tissue and that applies um, to doing our biopsies through the oral cavity and not through the skin. And one big thing that's really helpful is if you do an excisional biopsy, take really careful notes or even take a photo of where the tumor was because often if you shave it off at the gum line and then they come back for surgery two weeks later, you won't be able to see anything there. And so if you've got a fibrosarcoma on your biopsy result, and then you go to look in the mouth and you can't tell where you were originally, it's going to make it a lot, um, a lot harder to do a definitive surgery. I've had another question posted, which is, is fever common in oral tumors? That's not something that I see. The only time that you would see fever is if you had tumor necrosis because the tumor was growing so rapidly that it's outgrown its blood supply. All right, as far as staging is concerned, uh, you can, uh, when you're looking at the primary tumor, you can do radiography, CT scan, or MRI. If you're looking at secondary spread, you can do lymph node aspirates, chest x-rays, or chest CT scan, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So interestingly, in one study, bony lysis was not evident on flat film radiographs until 50% of the bone is gone. So that's not a particularly sensitive way to see if we've got destruction of bone. CT scan is better for looking at destruction of bone. Uh, but it's not as good as MRI. MRI really shows secondary inflammation and extent of tumor and stuff, and so there are things that you would miss even on a CT scan that you might pick up on MRI. Practically speaking, we do lose, use a lot of CT scan for these, and I, and I do get a lot of clean margins, although that may be uh, a factor when I'm removing oral fibrosarcomas that maybe if I had an MRI that that would provide uh, better local tumor control because I'd be better able to see the extent of the tumor. All right, when we're looking at the regional lymph nodes, uh, cytology is really helpful. Generally, we're talking about the submandibular lymph nodes that are very close to the salivary glands. Uh, and then when we're looking at the thorax, three of you, thoracic radiographs or computed tomography um, with CT scan being the gold standard for looking at pulmonary metastasis. Now, as far as treating the primary tumor, generally we have two different treatment options, and those are going to be surgery or radiation therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. With respect to surgery, we want to get at least two to three centimeters beyond any visible, palpable, or imaging extent of the tumor. So if we've got a tumor that's two centimeters in diameter, that means that we're going to be taking six centimeters of mandible to get this thing out. And when we look at this picture right here, you can see a two centimeter tumor. And we're going to go all the way up to the base of that canine, and we're going to go all the way back behind that last, uh, or just in front of the last molar, uh, in order to get our clean margins on that. Antibiotics are not required in these cases after surgery, so we usually give a dose of uh, cephalexin or cefazolin at the time of surgery, but we do not send these patients home on antibiotics. Now, this is a bit of a soapbox of mine. 
um, in that uh, I think that we as a profession use antibiotics way too frequently. And it's been shown repeatedly that prophylactic antibiotics after surgery do not reduce the risk of infection with any kind of surgery um, and in fact can increase the risk of infection with a lot of cases and you get resistant, uh, resistant bacteria. So there is no justification with a sterile or clean surgery uh, to send them home on a week's worth of antibiotics. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're breeding drug resistance or antibiotic resistance in our, in our bacteria. Um, I like to use local, local nerve blocks when I can, and so the mandibular nerve uh, that's coming into the mandibular foramen, um, and um, I do infraorbital nerve blocks when I do maxillectomies as well. Anytime that we can use local nerve blocks, we're going to really improve our pain control after surgery. Um, the comment here um, is uh, we don't treat excised cancer sites with local uh, laser acu acupuncture because it can stimulate regrowth of the tumors. Um, and, uh, and let's see, change the type of tumor growth as it's particularly good for um, increasing scar tissue is important to make sure that the fibrous tissue is not cancerous. No need, okay, it's a no need for the, the speaker to discuss this, but um, anyway, so uh, it's generally been re recommended that uh, laser acupuncture not be used on can uh, cancer sites because of the potential to stimulate growth. As far as pain relief after surgery, I believe that you need to use full agonist opiates, so that's going to be your morphine, oxymorphone, or methadone, uh, or fentanyl or something like that to uh, treat post-operative um, post pain. Um, I have another question or comment. Um, so the question is, you talk about sterile surgery and antibiotics, can you ever be truly sterile in the mouth? The answer to that is no, you cannot, but um, you do not need to use antibiotics in these cases, even if it's a non-sterile surgery. Um, the question about local anesthetic drugs, I like to use Mepivacaine because it lasts for six to eight hours and it's very inexpensive. So we use, um, we use a lot of Mepivacaine postoperatively. There's another question, with respect to antibiotic use, isn't it difficult to get a sterile surgical site in the mouth? Yes, it is difficult to get a sterile surgical mouth uh, site. We do use a weak betadine or chlorhexidine mouthwash, but um, once we get that tumor out and we've done our surgery, there is no indication to use antibiotics in oral surgery. Um, and, you know, I would imagine that if you were doing a dental or something and you had a huge amount of gen gingivitis and periodontal disease, that that would be an indication to use antibiotics. But when we're doing a surgery and we're not dealing with really bad gingivitis and that kind of thing, um, there's no indication for antibiotic therapy, even if the tumor has necrotic spots that have ruptured. As long as you get in there and get the tumor out and you're back to what you think are clean margins, again, no indication for antibiotics. Um, when you're doing, we'll get back to our lecture here, when we're doing our, um, sorry, I've lost my, so when we're doing our tumor surgery, um, we need to consider nutrition postoperatively and particularly in cats, we'll put an esophagostomy tube in them in order to provide nutrition because a lot of cats are going to be reluctant to eat after surgery. And we often use fentanyl patches uh, for postoperative analgesia uh, because that's going to provide full agonist, opiate agonist analgesia and that's going to last for four days after surgery. Uh, dental considerations, uh, also we, we tend to use an oscillating bone saw to remove bone. Um, you can use giggly wire or an osteotome, but I don't like to use an osteotome because that tends to shatter the, the bone and so you're going to get big bone shards and it might even break into the tumor site. Unless you have a really, really sharp osteotome, you ought to be using an oscillating saw or even a, like a, um, a hobby saw or something like that that has a serrated edge rather than using an osteotome. You can use bone tunnels to anchor the sutures to the maxilla and rostral mandible and so that's really, really helpful um, to keep or to prevent dehiscence because um, dehiscence is a really common complication that we see with our big, um, uh, with our big um, oral tumor surgeries. There's another question here. If dental hygiene is poor, would you recommend a dental post-surgery? Um, I would. Again, I, well, I don't do any dentistry at all. 
Um, and so I don't know specifics, but in general, my general tendency would be um, probably to do it before surgery, um, if, if you could. Like if you're doing your initial biopsy and you see this math, mass, I, it would make sense to me to, uh, you know, to do a scaling and, and, um, and uh, prophylaxis before we get into surgery so that we're less likely to have an infected oral cavity. Um, when we're trying to prevent dehiscence, um, sorry, keeps jumping ahead. When we're um, trying to prevent dehiscence, a secure closure is really, really important. Again, using our bone tunnels, we can you, we can drill little bone tunnels using a wire driver or just a you know a, a 054 or 062 pin in a hand chuck and just make little holes in the bone that then we can anchor to the interstitial tissue. And um, blood loss can be substantial, so you need to be prepared for. Um, for blood loss and, and if you're doing like a maxillectomy, it's a good idea even to get a cross match and make sure that you've got a donor or uh, packed red cells available. And completeness of surgical margins have been shown to be predictive of local recurrence. Now these are just some examples of surgical treatment of tumors. Um, this is an oral fibrosarcoma that's sitting here in the maxilla um, right next to the, the molars. And so this is one that I'm going to be really concerned about getting a really wide margin because as it is an oral fibrosarcoma, it has a very high chance of local recurrence. So I'm going full thickness all the way through the hard palate, and then I'm going to bring the um, buccal mucosa across um, to close that defect. And the, the connective tissue that's deep to that mucosa, I'm going to anchor to the bone here, to the hard palate using bone tunnels. I have a question, do I use bone, bone wax in a maxillectomy? If I have bleeding from the bone, cut bone surface, then I certainly will use bone wax. This is another patient that has um, an, I can't remember if this was an epulis, it looks like an epulis to me or potentially a fibrosarcoma. And so I'm doing a partial mandibulectomy here, so I've cut through the gingiva along here. And this is actually a couple of centimeters away from the tumor, but it's retracted. And then I'm coming over here and you can see the mandibular nerve that's heading toward the mental foramen uh, um, at this point. And so this is also where the mandibular artery is. And if we can ligate that before we cut it, that's ideal. And so if I'm using an oscillating saw, what I'll do is I'll cut dorsally, ventrally, and laterally, just partial thickness so that I don't cut that artery. And then I'll physically break that with um, a freer elevator or something like that so that I can see that vessel and ligate it before I cut it. And that's a really good hint in order to try to prevent some of that blood loss. So this is a patient that we've gone all the way up to the temporomandibular joint and all the way up just behind the canine tooth um, to get, it's, it's, this would be a hemimandibulectomy. And if you have a highly malignant tumor like a, a melanoma that's going to grow down the mandibular canal, alongside the nerves and the artery, you really have to go up above the temporomandibular joint in order to get a complete margin. And I have had cases that I've had recurrence because um, I left some of the mandible caudally and the tumor grow, grew back from that mandibular canal. This is what they look like afterward. Cosmetically, they actually look really, really good. Um, the only thing that can be somewhat distressing to clients in these cases is that you can have some malalignment of the lower jaw with the upper jaw. Dogs tend to get better at it with time where they learn to realign their jaws, um, but it can be a little bit disconcerting to clients to hear the crunching of the teeth that are not quite lined up. Uh, this is another patient that had an oral fibrosarcoma, so you can see that this is a pretty common location. So we're doing a big maxillectomy here, um, and, uh, and then we're going to anchor the buccal mucosa over to the hard palate using bone tunnels. And this is what it looks like afterward. I tend to use, um, if I can, I use Vicol because it's a little bit softer. Uh, the other thing is that I try to bury my knots now. This, this knot clearly wasn't buried, but that's something that I prefer to do. So I'm going to skip the video right now. So this is an example of radiation therapy for a cat with an oral squamous cell carcinoma. Now, oral squamous cell carcinomas in cats are really, really devastating. 
and I don't think that anybody has found anything that's really effective to treat them. So if you have an, a squamous cell carcinoma in the mandible or sublingual region of a cat, that's really, really bad news. And you can try things like radiation therapy or chemotherapy, but I'm really not aware of anybody that's done anything to improve survival in these guys. Um, with radiation therapy for oral tumors in dogs, this is an example of the side effect that we see. So you're going to see a burn. This would be probably at about two weeks out after the end of radiation therapy. Very tolerable. Um, we don't have patients or owners that discontinue radiation therapy because of the side effects. And we did a study where we looked at use of radiation therapy and surgery for the treatment of nasal carcinomas in dogs and found that the satisfaction with the overall therapy and the success and the side effects uh, was on a scale of 1 to 10. Owners gave us a median score of a 10 out of 10 with their satisfaction. So while it is a little bit distressing, owners look in the wrong, long run and think that that was definitely worthwhile. This is another radiation therapy side effect. So this would be at about a month out from radiation therapy. And you can see that we've lost some pigmentation here and a little bit of swelling, some moist desquamation, but that does improve with time. So um, the way that I remember the tumors in the oral cavity, and if this is the only thing you remember from this lecture, remember this slide right here. Remember that dogs foam, or the dog foams at the mouth. And by foams, that's a mnemonic device where you think fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, uh, acanthomatous ameloblastoma, melanoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. So F-O-A-M-S. Whenever you see a dog with an oral tumor, you should think the dog foams at the mouth. F-O-A-M-S. Feline oral tumors, um, squamous cell carcinomas are by far the most common. Um, that's really the only one we see in the oral cavity of cats. Occasionally, you'll see a mast cell tumor or something like that. Um, going back to the dogs, um, just to give you some very brief um, uh, overview. So, acanthomatous ameloblastoma has a 0% metastatic rate. Fibrosarcoma is about 20%. Squamous cell carcinoma is about 40%. Osteosarcoma is probably about 60%. And melanoma is 80%. And the biggest prognostic indicator for melanoma is going to be the size of the tumor, whether it's less than two centimeters, two to four centimeters, or greater than four centimeters. And those are going to have very distinct survival times. Interestingly, with squamous cell carcinomas, it's how far rostral or caudal they are, with the ones that occur in the rostral mouth being much less aggressive than the ones that occur caudally in the mouth. So squamous cell carcinomas, it's going to be location rostral versus caudal, and with melanomas, it's going to be tumor size, less than two centimeters, two to four centimeters, and greater than four centimeters. Um, and then uh, fibrosarcoma, remember that histopathologic appearance does not affect prognosis, because even though they look very um, benign, they, um, they can behave quite malignantly with respect to recurrence of metastasis. Now, I have had a question, are there any dental side effects of radiation therapy? Um, late side effects, you could have some bone necrosis kind of a year to a year and a half out. I'm not aware specifically of extractions that are required because of necrosis or whatever in the mandible. It's not something that I've seen before. Um, I'd be interested to hear if anybody else has had that as a, as a complication. OK. so. Um, that was a quick review of oral tumors in dogs. Uh, let's just go back to um, the slide where we've got all the different ones uh, that we've list listed here. Now, um, I will take a minute to answer any questions if you guys have any. Uh, and then just um, to review again, the biggest thing is that the dog foams at the mouth. And so we've got fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, acanthomatous ameloblastoma, melanoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. And the most aggressive oral tumor in the dog is going to be a melanoma. Uh, the least aggressive is going to be an acanthomatous ameloblastoma. And that originally was called an acanthomatous epulis, but that's been changed. Um, and then in addition, you're going to see 
um, epulides like fibrominus and ossifying uh, uh, epulides which are quite um, which are quite benign and so when I talk about the dog foams at the mouth um, we can subcategorize epulides into acanthomatous and ossifying and fibrominous and um, I don't really count acanth I'm sorry I don't really count ossifying and fibrominous in this table because they're really pretty benign and you can just peel them off of the gingiva and they're going to be okay. So these five would correspond to the more malignant or aggressive tumors that we see in the mouth. Any other questions at this time? So I did have a video originally in this lecture but I don't think that videos transmit very well and so um, and let's see, tongue only tumors in the dog and cat. Okay, so the question is about tumors that occur in the tongue. Now, sublingual tumors most often are squamous cell carcinomas. And in dogs, you can do a partial or complete glossectomy. So you can take the whole, uh, you can take the whole tongue out or half of the tongue, and they do fine in dogs. Whereas in cats, they're going to be really reluctant to eat afterward. Um, so if you have a sublingual tumor, it's almost always going to be a squamous cell carcinoma. Now we do see some tumors that occur in the tongue itself, in dogs primarily, and those can be soft tissue sarcomas and occasionally mast cell tumors. And you just treat those like you would anywhere else. You want to get a couple of centimeter margin. Don't hesitate to take out half the tongue. Like if you're looking at the length of the tongue, you can take um, you can take 50% of the width of the tongue out and still have the end of the tongue survive as long as you don't destroy both of the lingual arteries. Um, those, the, the whole tongue is going to survive and it's going to be very functional. So um, that's certainly something that you can do. And another question about salivary gland tumors. The one that we see most commonly would be a salivary gland adenocarcinoma and that has potential to be quite malignant. Um, it can metastasize and so it would be a really good idea to do complete staging, including um, doing um, lymph node aspirates and chest radiographs or chest CT scan before we cut those out. Locally, we can usually get a complete margin on them, even though there are a lot of important structures around there. I like to say important structures with short names, or don't cut anything you know the name of. But um, regardless of that, you can still get a complete margin on a lot of them. Any other questions? I'll just wait for a second here. So again, uh, okay, from having oral, let's see, let me just read this. So the question is, or the comment from a, a participant was, from having oral surgery, I can say that the endotracheal tube burns your throat like fire for weeks. The nerve pain can last for months. You can feel the absorbable sutures, and any amount of pain relief is insufficient. Being human, at least we can use symptomatic mitigating treatments such as ice. Can you suggest any adjunct treatments the client might be able to use to enhance patient comfort post-surgery, please. So the biggest thing that I think we can do is prevent preemptive analgesia, and that's going to be by using nerve blocks and stuff before we, um, before we remove the, the tumor, or at least do a local infiltration with mepivacaine you know, after the tumor is removed. So I think that that's the biggest thing that we can do. Other than that, um, you know, full agonist uh, narcotic agents are going to be helpful, and then you can do like a weak green tea solution, which seems to be really comforting to some patients, like um, particularly our radiation patients. The other thing that you can do is external ice. Um, so external ice packs and frozen peas and stuff to the outside. Most of our patients we do, um, like every, almost every surgical patient in the hospital afterwards, we try to ice the incision, which seems to be really comforting. Um, so that's something that you can do as well. Uh, the next question was how much of the length of the tongue can be removed? In cats, relatively little, so I'd say probably about 30% um, or they, they stop eating and they can stop eating for weeks or even months. Whereas in dogs, particularly dogs that have, um, we, um, 
in dogs you can you can remove you know 50 to 60 percent of the tongue and even in a breed if you have a breed of dogs that has a really good appetite like Labrador or something like that I've taken the entire tongue out from, uh, before and they learn to suck water out of the bowl rather than lap it up and we usually feed them initially by rolling up meatballs of some kind of wet um, dog food and then eventually they learn to eat regular dog food again. The next comment was I occasionally see vascular tumors in the tongues of dogs and I would assume, assume that that's a hemangiosarcoma. Um, I'm not sure and I haven't seen many of them but I would assume that they would behave fairly aggressively if they were to occur. Um, the next question is how would you deal with an oral mass that is involving bone lysis biopsied as a fungal infection? Even with fungal disease, if you can resect it, you're better off. And then I would probably use, again, as a cancer surgeon, um, you know, I would use probably a couple of centimeters because, you, you know, there's potential to leave some of that behind. And then the antifungals going forward, your um, uh, enoconazole or itraconazole. And being a surgeon, I don't use a lot of those medications, so I'd probably defer to an internal medicine specialist um, when deciding which ones to use. Any other questions or comments? I'll wait just a second. Well, I hope that that was helpful to you. It was a fairly brief review of oral tumors, and I'm always happy to receive emails and phone calls. The best email to use would be info at southpaws.com.au. I'll type that in there, info at southpaws.com.au. And we have um, a surgeon that's monitoring that email address basically seven days a week. And so whichever surgeon's on call that weekend will review the, um, the emails that are coming in. And so, um, uh, and so you're more than welcome to use that. We get emails all the time. Um, we can send a PDF of the presentation. Um, I just have to talk to Noam about how we will distribute those to people, but I'm happy to do that. Yeah, Charles, we normally upload notes to the site. So um, after about a day or two, we'll upload the webinar recording and also all the notes. So if anybody has any um, questions, they will, I guess if you put your um, email in the notes, and that will be um, included as well. Okay. Well, I think that's it, and that's about an hour, so I'm right on schedule. Thank you very much for everybody's attention and all the great questions. I always know that people were involved and interested in the lecture when we get a lot of questions, and that's probably as many questions as I've ever gotten in a webinar, so that's true. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. Thank you very much, Charles. That was, that was fantastic. So thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, we'll post um, all of that uh, for you online in the next day or two. So um, have a good night. Thanks again, Charles. Thank you very much, Norman. Just remind me about sending that PDF through. Sure, sure. I will, no problem. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All Bye. Right. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night.